Hey guys, Rolf here with Block Operations again. Talk some more about things that you need to know when you're running a Bitcoin mining facility or altcoins or whatever you're mining these days. Today I want to talk about data networking. So, uh, data networking is um, something that I take for granted. I've been doing it for many years. The last business I had was a data networking company. Uh, it was a Cisco Gold Partner that I started. Uh, sold it a couple of years ago. So it can be pretty complex. The people that you talk to can make it even more complex, but the data networking that you need for a mining facility is not that complex. So let's go through the different elements and give you at least an overview of it, and so that when you talk with a network specialist, uh, you have some realm of uh, common uh, points for discussion. All right, let's start out with coming from the outside in. You got the big old internet here, and that's what you're connecting to everybody else on. The way Bitcoin works is there's a bunch of nodes out there. They all talk with each other, and they figure out you know, who gets the next set of transactions. So you're going to connect your miners to a mining pool. And we're going to assume for now, since we're talking mostly Bitcoin, that this is a mining pool that somebody else runs. So you need to connect to it quickly, um, but there's differences between even the basic connectivity terms uh, of quickly, and let's talk through that a little bit. I have a bit of experience with data networks. The company I owned previously, IDCAP Network Systems, uh, our big thing that we did was we worked with uh, public sector organizations like colleges and universities and cities and counties and good-sized businesses to upgrade their local area network, to upgrade their network security, their servers, their storage, their Wi-Fi, uh, and in a lot of cases to deploy an entire Cisco phone system over that network. So this is anywhere from 50 to 5,000 users. So I can get pretty technical on this, but I don't want to because there's really no reason to. But one of the big things that people often confuse is they say I want to get good internet, I want to get my miners talking to the mining pools quickly and so I need a lot of bandwidth. Well, bandwidth's not really what you need. What you need is low latency. So the, the latency comes from a bunch of different things. Mostly it comes from just distance, so electricity and going through the different switching paths. Um, it, it takes time over distance, but it can also happen when things stack up at choke points. So, so if you get um, internet from your local cable company or somebody like that, they'll often oversubscribe. So they'll, they'll bring in, um, there'll be lots more users that are trying to get access to the internet than they want. So during, uh, through the path of the cable, they'll, um, there'll be choke points where your information slows down. So in a lot of cases, when you buy more bandwidth, even though you don't use all the bandwidth, it kind of frees up those choke points. So if you do get more bandwidth, you can oftentimes reduce your latency, but it's, it's the overall the latency that you want to reduce. In fact, some of the uh, lowest latency connections can be very low bandwidth. So those are the, the major things that you want to talk about when you're purchasing your internet from uh, the internet providers. You don't need a huge pipe, it just needs to be low latency. Unfortunately, with most consumer grade, they won't give you a service level agreement for latency, so you end up having to get bandwidth. Anyway, you bring uh, network into your location and they'll provide some kind of router or modem. Now, uh, that can be a complete router and modem with a firewall and Wi-Fi and everything like that. I, I don't like using the cable company's Wi-Fi and firewall. Uh, so in a lot of cases, I'll turn off the Wi-Fi because other people sometimes can connect to it, uh, you know, cable program, uh, and then I'll uh, port forward the outside interface, and I'll take that outside interface and port forward it to my firewall. So it's very important that you own your own firewall because there's a number of different things that you can do with it. Uh, the firewall that I like best, it's an enterprise grade firewall. It's actually a Cisco Meraki. It's about a $500 firewall. Now I get the three year 
high-end security license on it because it's got the best intrusion prevention system in the business. Uh, it also includes MIMO Wi-Fi and one thing that I really like is that you can not only get an internet connection on it, but you can take one of these LAN ports and turn it into a second internet connection so that if you lose your primary internet connection it flips over to the second internet connection and you can even put a, uh, a cell phone modem in here as a third way of getting to the internet. So this is a great, um, this is a great firewall. You can remote access VPN to it, you can do all sorts of different things with it. And the best thing is, it's cloud controlled. So when I'm at home, I can see everything on my firewall by going to meraki.cisco.com and logging into my firewalls and seeing everything that's going on with them. I can configure them, I can do all sorts of different things. Um, so that is one thing that I recommend that you never skimp on, it's a really good firewall. So I think the model these days is like the MX64 wireless um, with a three year um, security package. There's like a low security and a high security package. Definitely get that because that, that lets you uh, go to a second internet provider. Like I got a Comcast cable and then I got a second one from AT&T. In my other office, I couldn't get AT&T so I did a, a cell phone modem here and that's my backup. And you really need to have backup because your internet will go down. And you don't want all your miners to stop mining just because your primary internet got, it went down. You need your secondary internet running as well. So that's the, the big thing on, on the firewall. Then inside that, you have what's called the local area network, uh, the LAN. And this is all network switches. You're going to end up having a lot of different network switches. Now, this is what they look like. This is a Meraki 24 port network switch. Now, as much as I like Meraki, um, Meraki switches for your purposes are going to be overpriced. So let me draw out kind of what you're going to want for a local area network. Okay, so here's our internet connection and it's connected through the, the, the router to our firewall. And we want to talk about these network switches and about how we're going to do the IP addressing of the organization. And we'll talk about IP addressing in a little bit. Let's talk about the physical network switches first. Um, you really don't need to get expensive switches. The, the data rate that we're talking about, since everything goes to the internet and nothing is actually done internally, your limiting factor is going to actually be your internet pipe. Now, the internet pipe that I got is like 50 megabits per second, and I use a lot less. So I buy old used switches that are 100 meg switches, megabits per second. Um, I'm not going to explain megabits per second right now, uh, but a lot of times people think, okay, I need the fastest network switches that are out there, I need gigabit switches. So. You know, 1,000 megabits per second. Well, 1,000 megabit per second, just because it connects in a switch at that speed, doesn't mean it's going to get out to the internet at that speed. You're limited by your internet connection. So you can get the less expensive 100 megabit connections. And I was just at Fry's, and I saw you could get, you know, 24 port switches for, I don't know, $200 or so from Linksys. And you know what? Those are pretty good. Those are all you really need. I prefer to get 48 port switches. Uh, just because it gives you a little bit more flexibility, but not, not really a big deal. When we're talking about racks, um, we're talking about racks in our typical setup where we have 24 miners in a rack. If we stick a 24 port switch on there, that's great. Um, as long, you know, maybe if it doesn't come with two or four uplinks, then you just stick 22 miners on there. What you do want to do is set up some kind of redundancy. Uh, depending on the level of the size of your operation and what it's going to cost you to have it down for a day kind of gives you a, uh, a figure for what you want to pay for redundancy. You can even set up a Meraki firewall. I'm not sure if the small one will do it so it can be done as, as a failover. Um, that's a little bit more complex. You might want to prefer just having an in-place spare. Like I got, an, I got an old Meraki firewall that I could plug in and fire up pretty quickly, uh, so I wouldn't even have to, to get one. Uh, but you do want to assume that network cables or the ports that they're plugged into can fail. So standard network topology um, 
it, it talks about a, a core and distribution layer, and that's kind of what we're building, and then an access layer. An access layer is where the access devices plug into it. So assuming that all these are a switch that's on top of a rack, what we'd like to do is connect the switches so there aren't multiple hops. It's tempting sometimes to connect one switch to another, to another, to another, but you don't really want to do that because then the information has to hop from one switch to another. And then if any one switch fails in this case, um, then all the other switches drop off it as well. You don't really want that. So the way you want to physically connect the network cables is to connect them to the distribution layer. So connect these guys to the distribution layer here, and then also connect them to the distribution layer here. The network switches have something that will shut down the port and prevent loops. It's called spanning tree protocol. Most of them just have it turned on automatically, so you don't really have to worry about it. Um, but that way, these ports, so you can see the distribution switches get kind of busy. Uh, if they're 48 port switches, then you got enough switches on top of the rack. Um, in a lot of cases, you're going to just want to have dedicated switches as your distribution switches. Now, this type of network topology uh, is really expandable, and it's reliable, and it's, it's the type of setup that you need. So, within that, uh, let's talk about IP addressing. If you want to learn about IP addressing, I'm sure there's a lot of good YouTube videos and other things like that. The basic industry standard for understanding this stuff um, is the Cisco Certified Network Associate. So if you go do some uh, Googling around on how to get your Cisco Certified Network Associate or the prep for that, it'll go through and explain all the IP addressing and different things like that that you need. And if you're going to contract with someone, uh, it'd be a good idea my personal opinion, to work with someone that uh, works at a local Cisco service provider. Uh, there's uh, certifications beyond the CCNA. Uh, there's CCNA, which is the associate, there's the uh, design associate, and there's the CCDP and the CCNP, Cisco Design Professional and Network Professional. These are really uh, folks that you'll want to hire if you're going to hire to do some work on your system. Above that uh, is a CCIE, Cisco Certified Internet Working Expert. These guys tend to be fairly expensive. They're, they're very knowledgeable. Sometimes um, they like to design really complex networks. They're probably going to be overkill for what you're looking to do if you're going to uh, hire a consultant on your network side of things. Well, let's talk about IP addressing. Um, you get a public IP address from the internet and um, I just get you know, I just have a dynamic IP address because I'm not hosting any services out of there, so they hand me some kind of IP address. Um, and then I run a permanent internal IP addressing scheme. Um, internal IP addressing. And my uh, firewall does the network address translation and the port address translation, so all my internal devices are able to go out through that one external IP address. Um, so internal IP addressing schemes, they typically come in three different numbers. 192.168.x.x, uh, .x, .x, 172.... I forget what it is. And then the, the 10. Now, a lot of folks, they start out because their uh, machines default to it with a 192.168.IP address scheme. And I prefer to stay away from that. Because these uh, octets, they go from uh, 0 to 255 on, on each of these octets. Uh, and it, the network determines how many devices that you can have on it. So in a lot of cases, uh, an entire network description is going to be the like 192.168.5.5. That's going to be a specific IP address of maybe a device on the network. Within that, you're going to have a default gateway. So if you can't find someone on your local network, you send it to the default gateway and he'll dump you out to a different network. So the default gateway, in a lot of cases, might be 192.168.1.1. So that's the default gateway. Now, within here, we're not talking about the subnet mask. The subnet mask is very important. And it's a mask that's applied to the IP addressing scheme to say, okay, what can change? And the problem with the 192.168 uh, IP addressing scheme 
is that in most cases, your subnet mask is 255.255.0, which means you can have network devices that are numbered from 1 to 255. Well, if we're going up to 800 devices on our network, and we don't want to get fancy by doing subnetting or things like that, that's not going to work. So we need to initially change our subnet mask to something that gives us more network capability. So we're going to change this third octet to a zero. Then all of a sudden, it opens up. We can do one. On here, we can do like one. We can do five. We can do 18. We can do all sorts of different things. And they, they can all talk to each other on the local area network. So that's the first big thing. Make your subnet mask, whatever network pro protocol you choose, um, for your internal IP addressing scheme, you need to make it 255.255.0.0 for your subnet mask. Because that will let you have a flat network and you don't really need anything other than a flat network for going up to you know, 1,000, 2,000 machines. They're not talking to each other, stuff like that. There, you can break things down again into different subnets. And if you get above maybe a thousand devices, you're going to want to do that, just so there's not a lot of crosstalk and chatter and things like that. But that's really more advanced than what we need to do here. However, the problem is when you go to have multiple locations. With multiple locations, I like to take the second octet and make that the location, um, uh, the, the location indicator. So the problem is with the 192 IP address scheme, you can't change that second octet. That's why I always use the 10 dot network scheme, because you can change each of these octets for what you need. And so I'll typically make this the location indicator. And then in a lot of cases, just make these uh, for the flat network. So my subnet mask for well, my office here, for example, it's something like 10.8.0.0 on a slash 16 network. A slash 16 network means that we take the 16 rightmost bits and can change them. So the subnet mask on that is 00. zero. And my default gateway, I like to keep things simple, is just going to be 10.8.0.1. And then I've got a lot of flexibility to, to play with. And then if I have a second location, which I do, uh, I might make that um, like 12 or something like that. And that way, I don't get confused as to what location I'm on uh, when I'm um, doing different things. Anyway, that's my advice to you, is initially set up with a network mask of 255.255.0.0 and use a 10.0 private IP addressing scheme. All this gets set up in your firewall and it's set up within your DHCP server. Your DHCP server, DHCP stands for Dynamic Host uh, Configuration Protocol, is what hands out IP addresses onto your device. The nice thing about your firewall or router or things like that is it keeps track of everybody who it hands out the IP addresses to. So if you give your device a name, like I give each my, one of my Antminer S9s a name, then when it grabs an IP address from the firewall, it puts its name in there as well. So I can always go to my firewall and say, okay, I got to get to this specific device, and I number them, um, what's its IP address? And then I can go to it right from there. Uh, you can also reserve IP addresses. Um, Although, to me, that's more trouble than it's worth, except for uh, very specific devices like uh, network switches or other things like that that you always want to access. Because what I've found is most devices these days, once they grab an IP address from a DHCP server, they're always going to ask for that IP address, and they're always going to get it. So they're never really going to change that. Um, but you definitely want to set up your DHCP scope. That's, um, um, well, you set up. You set up your IP addressing scheme with your firewall, and then you set up your scope, and it just hands out IP addresses uh, to everybody. So those are the big things on the, on the network. You want to have uh, a good firewall, again, a Meraki. This one's even got the wireless built into it, multiple uplinks, very secure, intrusion detection system, network switches. You can see this has 24 network ports and then four uplinks. I don't pay for little things to stick into there because I don't... I figure I don't even need to uplink faster than 100 megabits per second. Um, 
and the Wi-Fi that's built in. And if you start getting bigger than 1,000, 1,500 devices, then you want to talk to a network guy about subnetting the network uh, so that there isn't any, um, so there isn't a lot of broadcast traffic. Anyway, uh, so that's the big thing on. That's pretty much most of the things for, for data networking for mining operations. If you have questions, just like always, ask me a, a question on YouTube or ask it on my website or you can see me out on the, the, the different forums and stuff like that. I've got a, a pretty consistent uh, ID of block ops. So. Have a great day. Thanks.